When I was a, a banker on Wall Street at J.P. Morgan, people quoted the words of Walter Riston, the scion of banking, who said, capital goes where it is welcome and stays where it is well treated. You get the drift. And he meant both financial and human capital. It applies to tourist and investor capital. Now take, take America, where, like us, tourism is the number one service export. Anne Madison of Brand USA said, after 9-11, we made America unwelcoming. People abroad saw America as a been there, done that trip. She continued, so we're going to be putting more and more energy into making the US more welcoming, adding, of course, you can't change negative perceptions by marketing alone. And you know, in Jamaica, I once walked past a shop with a sign which read, we were open. And as you know, just a short while ago, Grand Bahama ranked as one of the least popular ports of call in the Caribbean. But last Friday, Freeport Bahamas Adventurers was awarded top tour operator of the year in the Caribbean for 2015 by no less than our toughest critic, the world's largest cruise line carnival. So unlike that sign in Jamaica, I'm pleased to say we are open. We can reinvent ourselves as a destination. Look at the Jaguar launch here now with that lovely cruise ship on the skyline filled for the next two weeks with two and a half thousand Jaguar dealers from all over the world. And if Dr. Bethel was here, I'd say they may well be here because of our good roads. <laughs> and that was a well, last year marked the 60th anniversary of the birth of this city, Freeport, and the demise of certain uh, concessions. But for all the noise, the Hawkesbury Creek Agreement is really a free trade zone charter and a city charter with jurisdiction at the local level of Freeport, not the whole of Grand Bahama or anywhere else for that matter. And much is made of its powers, but actually 75% of countries now have free trade zones. And in the US, many of the 50 states and cities have their own charters, where regulation, property tax, and other taxes can vary according to the needs of the locality and yet still be aligned with the nation. Many of those 50 United States receive government grants concessions or subsidies, many subsist on them. And by the way, the GBPA itself receives no government grants and pays no dividends to its shareholders. You sustain it and we sustain it and it sustains Freeport. Road and subdivision maintenance, zoning, town planning, regulatory oversight, building code, environmental policy, promotion, scholarships, animal control, fire hydrants, street lighting, Christmas lighting, storm drains, and so on. A coordinated approach to Freeport's development. Dull stuff. But Warren Buffett says, don't invest for applause. Really good work should be greeted, should be greeted by a yawn. There are no work permits in the group, and indeed some St. George and Hayward family members are Bahamian-born citizens. GBPA and Port Group are quintessentially Bahamian. Now lately, you've heard much about the word deficit in Freeport. Actually, as you heard from the governor of the central bank, the entire nation is running a deficit, as are many, many nations and America itself. But are we in Freeport really contributing to a national deficit? And if we are, is that deficit truly greater than the national average, as stated in the McKinsey report? Is it 50 million per that report? 
And also, what's being counted and what isn't? And how does it portend for the economy of Freeport if even more is exacted from Freeport on top of 7.5% VAT last year? Are we expected to underwrite an annual deficit with no spending controls? Cui bono, as the Latin expression goes. To what end? Instead of central government carving out a larger slice of the Freeport pie, or indeed swallowing it whole, how much simpler to actually grow the pie, grow the jobs? As Mr. Seymour said, under clause 1.5, a bill has never in 60 years been presented. And we say that that would be regressive it would open a Pandora's box without a consensus going forward. And that also speaks to the last point on Kevin Seymour's evolution of the HCA slide. You and your money will continue after these messages. Freeport Report encourages residents to become active citizens in improving our city by reporting non-emergency issues in their neighborhoods, all through the convenience of an easy-to-use and free mobile app. You can instantly report issues from within the GBPA areas, quickly map issues you see on the street, answer a few questions, provide detailed descriptions, photos, and videos right from your device. Whether it's your neighbor or the responsible department within GBPA, those who need to know will receive an instant alert of issues reported. You can also comment on issues, vote them up, and share issues on Facebook and other social media sites to get even more citizens involved. You can report matters such as illegal dumping, unpermitted construction activity, damaged water meters, and a host of other issues that may affect your neighborhood and the city at large. We all want to make our city comfortable and issue free, and now there's an app just for that. Keeping our city well managed and beautiful just got a little bit easier. All you have to do is see, click, and fix with Freeport Report. Download the Freeport Report app today, available for free in Google Play and the Apple App Store. Get ready. Coming up next in the Bahamas Business Outlook series is the fourth annual Eleuthera Business Outlook. The conference will be held this year at the picturesque Valentine's Residences Resort and Marina on April 21st, 2016 under the theme, A Bold Agenda for the Next 25 Years. This year's Eleuthera Outlook features a special package for $524. This includes a round trip on the Bahamas Ferries, a one night stay at the Valentine's Resort, and the Outlook registration fee. For more information, contact Margaret Albury at 322-7505. From the days of our earliest settlers, there's been the spirit. Ever since our first visitors, there's been a special flavor. There's been the freedom, and of course, the people. Experience Eleuthera. Experience Eleuthera, with people to people. Call 3560435 and volunteer as a People to People Ambassador today. You are watching You and Your Money, highlights of the 18th Annual Grand Mahama Business Outlook. And now, we continue with the presentation given by Ms. Sarah St. George, Vice Chairman at the Grand Mahama Port Authority. Freeport already directly and indirectly sends to the National Treasury 20 times more than the GBPA receives to maintain Freeport. In other words, GBPA operates with 5% of the sum that is sent to Nassau. And Freeport is an area two and a half times larger than the whole of New Providence. In dollars and cents, the GBPA collects between eight to 10 million a year to spend on Freeport, and some $200 million goes to Nassau. So let's look at the receipts of central government from Freeport as assessed by our advisors, KPMG. Customs duties of 60 million annually, airport taxes, four million a year from a privately built and maintained airport, road tax of six million a year on privately built and maintained roads, Import duties, 4.6 million a year. $100 million in stamp tax was paid 
uh, to the government by Borco a few years ago. Using an average amortization, it would be fair to say the government earns about 20 million a year in stamp tax, but McKinsey numbers didn't include anything for stamp tax. Cruise passenger taxes of five million a year, 10 and a half million a year in work permit fees, uh, six million in communication fees, three and a half million in land and survey leases, registrar general fees of a million, miscellaneous two million. Gaming fees from Freeport, about 6.6 .6 million a year. VAT of 30 million per annum, also excluded by McKinsey as the amount was unknown at the time. NIB contributions from Freeport of $45 million a year. Now, should the Surgeon General use a scalpel or an ax here, uh, I ask you, and there are a few doctors in the house. Also, don't forget the $11 billion in infrastructure value created here without adding to the country's balance sheet debt, which we all pay for ultimately. National debt, has grown from some 60 to 70% of gross domestic product, and that's a, a big number. Bahamas Power and Light will need 450 to 500 million, or 5% of that GDP in the near future. All this has to be repaid, plus interests in millions of dollars a year for which the government looks to us by way of VAT. Freeport's infrastructure cost has been borne by equity investors. Those new companies and expert JV partners who accepted the invitation to invest here, especially after the 1993 property tax extension. Simple, right? And again, don't just think about the dollar cost of those 21 commitments in 1993 in exchange for the concessions. Think about $4 billion of new investment in a container port, Alukaya Hotel, the shipyard, Pharmachem, Polymers, Borco, Amera, MSC, and many more. Probably $2 billion in the last seven years alone. Did the families play their part in that? Of course they did. Were the 1993 concessions fulfilled to the best of Edward and Jack's ability? Of course they were. And yes, the government of the day accepted that they were. And actually, I'd argue that they went above and beyond. Have Freeport's stakeholders Everyone here made a return on their investment. At times, yes, and at times, no. And remember, you must distinguish between a going concern return as opposed to a, a sale or exit or liquidation. Could execution of strategy have been improved by all of us along the way? Most certainly. You and your money will continue after these messages. Shipping hubs around the world are deepening their harbor in preparation for the Panama Canal expansion. We deepened our harbor more than a decade ago. Special economic zones are popping up all over the world, offering tax concessions to potential investors. We've been offering zero taxes for the past six decades. Some call it a rich history. We call it the Grand Vision. Grand Bahama Island. Imagine the possibilities. You are watching You and Your Money. Highlights of the 18th Annual Grand Bahama Business Outlook. And now, we continue with the presentation given by Ms. Sarah St. George, 
Vice Chairman at the Grand Bahama Port Authority. And here are the casualties which we compiled in our report. These were not directly addressed by the committee in its recommendations, but we have them in the report. Our, our vulnerability to global markets, Arawak Hotel in the 80s, the Princess Hotel and Casino, which founded and sank as gambling restrictions in the US were lifted, then briefly tried to surface with the Irish group Harcourt until the Celtic Tiger economy tanked in Ireland, the bazaar caught and frozen in the domino effect of the hotel closure. Gin in the West End, which collapsed in the Great Recession of 2008. Xanadu, Port Lucaya Resort. The Grand Lucayan here squeezed by low average daily rates due to stopover tourists coming largely by cruise ships and the competition for cheaper and cheaper holidays. On the commercial and industrial side, companies like V-Trade, who failed to establish a logistic center due to complex customs bureaucracy and difficulties dealing with less than container loads. International distributors, which was not able to penetrate the Bahamian market as forecast, or to overcome the added road transport costs of containers leaving the container port for warehousing. There are no easy solutions, but there are simple ones, said one well-known head of state and you all know what they are as well as anyone. Ease of doing business, speed of execution, clear parameters for applications, immigration and other policies, long-term predictability provided under the HCA once we have certainty on the tax horizon, new equity. Well, we've hired Morgan Stanley to help us find new equity capital and project-specific capital. Yes, we are talking to MSC. In practical terms, this will be vastly helped by a regulatory and policy environment which such respectable buyers find acceptable, both in risk profile and a reasonable return on investment. For better access and experience, we'll help create a new non-US international and domestic terminal. Investment promotion, our GBPA is open to an independent commercial and industrial promotion board or tapping into an international advertising agency. Our GBPA will increase in transparency and community participation. GBPA can work with central government and IRCA to ensure that regulation of utilities and other regulation in the port area is consistent with national policy. We already have a power utility regulatory framework in place which accords with best international practices. GBPA can work with IRCA and with the government in general through the enactment of bylaws under the HCA. And IRCA doesn't yet have its electricity framework in place. The simplest step to grow the pie is to unlock the expansion plans of existing stakeholders here. The, the container port, phase five and six, to develop the Sea Air Business Centre, uh, the new Carnival Cruise Port. The second of three paths is real estate development, differentiating our model. And soon, my brother didn't want me to say this, but we will be able to unveil plans for a major new residential project, which will be known as Barbary Town. A financing commitment to develop this is being discussed, but all of the above hangs on these concession renewal discussions and our future. The third path is the implement implementation of micro-free trade zones and other special economic zones to redeem the failed areas of Grand Bahama. Remember, we used to be the only game in town. As you can see back in 1955 on that chart, but now SCZs are in 75% of all countries. Cayman Enterprise City, for example. Just look at the spike upwards in that blue line towards 2010. It's tough to remain competitive. And the opposite doesn't get us where we want to be. We think the forecast property tax revenues are significantly overblown. And business license fees. They don't expire, but clause 2.8 
expiry allows the government to impose extra license fees. However, the burden of those extra license fees will largely fall on Bahamian businesses, such as retail, cinemas, liquor stores, bars, nightclubs, because under clause 223A and B, which doesn't expire, all industrial, manufacturing, financial, insurance, legal, medical, health, real estate, hotel, marina, sports, entertainment, related activities and services are exempted. And McKinsey did not, I think, take this into account. So we are setting out on one of three paths. The top line is the dream, the bottom the dram, but the middle will do. Um, will, will our GBPA government public private sector partnerships survive, with or without us? Yes, I hope so. Because as Michael Eisner of Walt Disney Corporation said in a speech, and I quote, successful partnerships promote common sense, a common purpose, and strong ethics. Partners must value trust, keep ego in check, and put a premium on not just brains, but human decency. If we're in an age where loss of integrity is an ever-growing concern, then partnerships counter that. A Harvard University study showed there was one overriding cause of happiness. And again, I quote, sustained relationships over a long period of time, passing wisdom on to future generations, being adaptable and able to bounce back from disappointments being comfortable with the way someone else views the world. To summarize, working together is much better than working alone.